Books on Tape presents A Game of Thrones, Book One of A Song of Ice and Fire, by George R. R. Martin, read by Roy Detrice. Prologue We should start back, Garrett urged, as the woods began to grow dark around them. The wildlings are dead. Uh, do the dead frighten you? Sir Waymar Royce asked with just the hint of a smile. Garrett did not rise to the bait. He was an old man, past fifty, and he had seen the lordlings come and go. Dead is dead, he said. We have no business with the dead. Are they dead? Royce asked softly. What proof have we? Will saw them, Garrett said, and if he says they are dead, that's proof enough for me. Will had known they would drag him into the quarrel sooner or later. He wished it had been later rather than sooner. My mother told me that dead men sing no songs, he put in. My wet nurse said the same thing, Will, Royce replied. Never believe anything you hear at a woman's tit. There are things to be learned even from the dead. His voice echoed too loud in the twilight forest. We have a long ride before us, Garrett pointed out. Eight days, maybe nine, and night is falling. Sir Waymar Royce glanced at the sky with disinterest. It does that every day about this time. Are you unmanned by the dark, Garrett? Will could see the tightness around Garrett's mouth, the barely suppressed anger in his eyes under the thick black hood of his cloak. Garrett had spent forty years in the night's watch, man and boy, and he was not accustomed to being made light of. Yet it was more than that. Under the wounded pride, Will could sense something else in the older man. You could taste it, a nervous tension that came perilous close to fear. Will shared his unease. He had been four years on the wall. The first time he had been sent beyond, all the old stories had come rushing back, and his bowels had turned to water. He had laughed about it afterwards. He was a veteran of a hundred rangings by now, and the endless dark wilderness that the Southerns called the Haunted Forest had no more terrors for him. Until tonight. Something was different tonight. There was an edge to this darkness that made his hackles rise. Nine days they had been riding, north and northwest, and then north again, farther and farther from the wall, hard on the track of a band of wildling raiders. Each day had been worse than the day that had come before. Today was the worst of all. A cold wind was blowing out of the north, and it made the trees rustle like living things. All day Will had felt as though something was watching him, something cold and implacable that loved him not. Garrett had felt it too. Will wanted nothing so much as to ride hell-bent for the safety of the wall, but that was not a feeling to share with your commander, especially not a commander like this one. Sir Waymar Royce was the youngest son of an ancient house with too many heirs. He was a handsome youth of eighteen, grey-eyed and graceful and slender as a knife. Mounted on his huge black destrier, the knight towered above Will and Garrett on their smaller garrons. He wore black leather boots, black woolen pants, black moleskin gloves, and a fine supple coat of gleaming black ringmail over layers of black wool and boiled leather. Sir Waymar had been a sworn brother of the Night's Watch for less than half a year, but no one could say he was not prepared for his vacation, at least in so far as his wardrobe was concerned. His cloak was his crowning glory, sable, thick, and black, and soft as sin. Bet he killed them all himself, he did, Garrett told the barracks over wine. Twisted their little heads off, our mighty warrior. They had all shared a laugh. It is hard to take orders from a man you laughed at in your cups, Will reflected as he sat shivering atop his garron. Garrett must have felt the same. Mormont said, we shall track them, and we did, Garrett said. They're dead. They shan't trouble us no more. There's hard riding before us. I don't like this weather. If it snows, we could be a fortnight getting back, and snow's the best we can hope for. Ever seen an ice storm, my lord? The lordling seemed not to hear him. He studied the deepening twilight in that half-bored, half-distracted way he had. Will had ridden with the knight long enough to understand that it was best not to interrupt him when he looked like that. 
Uh, tell me again what you saw, Will. All the details. Leave nothing out. Will had been a hunter before he joined the Night's Watch. Well, a poacher, in truth. Malister Freeriders had caught him red-handed in the Malister's own wood, skinning one of the Malister's own bucks, and it had been a choice of putting on the black or losing a hand. No one could move through the woods as silent as Will, and it had not taken the Black Brothers long to discover his talent. The camp is two miles further on, over that ridge, hard beside a stream, Will said. I got close as I dared. There's eight of them. Men and women both. No children, I could see. They put up a lean-to against the rock. The snow has pretty well covered it now, but I could still make it out. No fire burning, but the fire pit was still plain as day. No one moving. I watched a long time. No living man ever lay so still. Did you see any blood? Well, no, Will admitted. Did you see any weapons? Some swords, a few bows. One man had an axe. Heavy-looking, double-bladed, a cruel piece of iron. It was on the ground beside him, right by his hand. Did you make note of the position of the bodies? Will shrugged. A couple are sitting up against the rock, most of them on the ground, fallen-like. Or sleeping, Royce suggested. Fallen, Will insisted. There's one woman up an ironwood, half hid in the branches. A far eyes. He smiled thinly. I took care she never saw me. When I got closer, I saw that she wasn't moving neither. Despite himself, he shivered. You have a chill? Royce asked. Some, Will muttered. The wind, my lord. The young knight turned back to his grizzled man of arms. Frost-fallen leaves whispered past them, and Royce's destrier moved restlessly. What do you think might have killed these men, Garrett? Sir Waymar asked casually. He adjusted the drape of his long sable cloak. It was a cold, Garrett said, with iron certainty. I saw men freeze last winter, and the one before, when I was half a boy. Everyone talks about snows forty feet deep, and how the ice wind comes howling out of the north. But the real enemy is the cold. It steals up on you quieter than will, and at first you shiver and your teeth chatter, and you stamp your feet and dream of mulled wine and nice hot fires. It burns, it does. Nothing burns like the cold, but only for a while. Then it gets inside you and starts to fill you up. And after a while, you don't have the strength to fight it. It's easier just to sit down or go to sleep. They say you don't feel any pain toward the end. First you go weak and drowsy and everything starts to fade. And then it's like sinking into a sea of warm milk, peaceful like. Oh, such elegance, Garrod, Sir Waymar observed. I never suspected you had it in you. I've had the cold in me too, Lordling. Garrod pulled back his hood, giving Sir Waymar a good long look at the stumps where his ears had been. Two ears, three toes, and the little finger of me left hand. I got off light. We found my brother frozen at his watch, with a smile on his face. Sir Waymar shrugged. You ought to dress more warmly, Garrod. Garrett glared at the lordling. The scars around his ear holes flushed red with anger, where Maester Eamon had cut the ears away. We'll see how warm you can dress when the winter comes. He pulled up his hood and hunched over his garron, silent and sullen. If Garrett said it was the cold, Will began. Have you drawn any watches this past week, Will? Yes, my lord. There never was a week when he did not draw a dozen bloody watches. What was the man driving at? And how did you find the wall? Weeping, Will said, frowning. He saw it clear enough, now that the lordling had pointed it out. They couldn't have frozen. Not if the wall was weeping. It wasn't cold enough. Royce nodded. Right, lad. We've had a few light frosts this past week, and a quick flurry of snow now and then, but surely no cold fierce enough to kill eight grown men. Men clad in fur and leather, let me remind you, with shelter near at hand and the means of making fire. The knight's smile was cocksure. Will lead us there. I would see these dead men for myself. And then there was nothing to be done for it. The order had been given, and honour bound them to obey.' 